I woke up like four minutes ago. <laughs> I literally fell asleep in my chair, did one of these body shakes. I looked at my clock and it was like three minutes. Uh, there's messages from Nicole. We're like, uh, link, please. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, Laura Stevens with a massive super chat there. Look at that. Thank you so much, gorgeous Laura Stevens. And uh, we're going to get going here in uh, just a few seconds. And uh, holy cow. I got to wake up. Somebody. Finger the line talk. It works wonders. Yeah, I might have to do that, R. Keith. Um, <laughs> hi, gorgeous Jenny. I am like. Well, that's the other option there, Nicole. Bielza Brad, nice to see you. We're going to get going in 29 seconds. Uh, thank you so much uh, for Kat, Carl, and Laura kicking off the Super Chat tonight. Hi, Sensational Sherry. It's a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. And, of course, hit that subscribe button, ring that bell. Fap, you don't know fashion. You couldn't fit this shirt over your head. Thurston Howell the <laughs> Third. nice to see you, buddy. Uh, the gorgeous I've been Marine. I've with Pat all night. Exactly. All right, five seconds. Let's do this thing right now. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, at KPNL. All of our archives are free. All you got to do is go to youtube.com forward slash space down radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Space Out Radio and on Instagram at Space Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com and we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. It is time once again where we all find our comfy seats. We grab our drinks, grab our snacks because we are about to ride on the Wu train tonight as our Keith Andrews is back for the ET Connection. Keith comes in once a month to break down everything UFO and extraterrestrial with us because, hey, Sometimes we're allowed a little fun and enjoyment in talking about the stranger things in life. And Keith, honestly, is one of the nicest people you could ever meet on this planet or out there talk, to talk about this subject. Joining us as well is newly crowned co-author and researcher. She's just not a cook anymore. Nicole Sackich. Research assistant with Grant Cameron. And before we bring Keith on, Nicole, I want to say congratulations <laughs> for hey. you. And, uh, you know, you're you're one of my best friends in this field. <laughs> and to have you uh, all of a sudden see your name on the front cover of a new book with Grant Cameron, it is uh, it hit me today when I saw it. And I'm not going <laughs> to lie, I fist pumped a few times. <laughs> You know, I woke up this morning and looked at it again and had a little moment. I was like, wow, this is the Grant Cameron effect. Honestly, completely like I don't, he's he's the writer. I'm just along for the ride. And, you know, turning a panel or two panel discussions into a book, you know, wow, it's mind blowing. So, you know me, I'm just forever grateful to my ufo boss now so this is nuts and yeah like i i'm not just a cook anymore it's official i have to change my title <laughs> yes co-author I, congratulations <laughs> you, if anybody deserves uh the respect and admiration in this field it's you <laughs> and i mean that sincerely as you know and our keith andrews my friend <laughs> my pal my pork chopped sideburn buddy how you doing <laughs> I'm still breathing, which is better than I was doing a couple of days ago, but, you know, what the heck? Well, you know, I mean, if you can't have a, a heart attack between friends, I mean, who can you have one with? I mean, right? 
Well, you know, you got to do something to pass the time. It breaks up the rest of the week. Very true. Very true indeed. How you been doing? How's the aliens been? Well, you know, it caught me a little off guard, but apparently I've been spending a lot more time up there than I thought. Because last week I was suffering almost daily from potassium crashes. And as it turns out, UV, uh, UV complications. Which once you get off planet, that's actually not that hard to pull off. Okay. Sounds interesting. And, and what do you mean by once you get off planet, that's how easy it is to pull well, off? Well, because on Earth, the the actual the normal atmosphere provides you UV protection. You know, contrary to popular belief, the you know the stuff that they that you buy for UV protection doesn't work as well as you might think. So, the, yeah. so what you're saying is the aliens are providing a solid ninety percent SPF or something like that for the sun. No, I mean the the atmosphere itself does a better job of it than what they than what mankind's SPF anything does. Gotcha, gotcha. I actually figured out a topic for tonight, and we haven't done it in a long, long time. And I know usually we throw our topics right out the window. Yeah, we'll start with it though. It's a good it's a good way to get started. Absolutely, get <laughs> absolutely. It, it is what a good was that way. Called? I said it might get mentioned. You give us the topic, well, it might get mentioned. <laughs> oh, mention usually that's it's it becomes a footnote in the discussion. Well, uh, what topic were you looking for there, Dave? <laughs> well, you know what? It came up in conversation because you, uh, I had a listener of mine uh, reach out to me who believes their child is being connected to extraterrestrials. Put it that way in a polite form. I'm not going to mention the person. I'm not going to mention the situation or anything like that because that's kind of in private for right now. But we haven't discussed children and UFOs in a long time. And, you know, this is something where as parents, Keith, and you're a parent, I'm a parent, Nicole's a parent, we always try and protect our children, you know, from anything that we can, except when it comes to UFOs, gets pretty difficult to be able to protect our children when they can seem to do anything that they want. <laughs> oh, and I couldn't agree with you much more than that. Well, you know, this is a um, close to heart topic for me. This is actually what brought me out of this introverted world of solo lone wolf research, you know, into the social media world. I, once I became a parent, I couldn't ignore certain things anymore. And I had to reach out to people and talk to them and have discussions instead of be alone in this. It was no longer just me. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but it is something that's kind of ever present with me right now, you know, with my research and my everyday life. I mean, just being a single mom, I can't do what I do and really exclude my son from it. And then being um, an experiencer and knowing what I know about that and the high strangeness that takes place, you know, you you have to do your diligence for. Oh, yeah, that's that's very much the case. I mean, I'm I'm in a strange boat from that one. You know, my my son. I've been telling him for years that I've been taken and I'm lucky in as much as they've left my kids alone. Yeah. To the point that it was only just a couple of years ago that my son actually got caught. He, he knew I'd been telling him it had been happening, but it was only a couple of years back that he actually came out and went, okay, now I've seen it. Now I believe it. Yeah. Was that a nice moment for you guys, or was it like a big moment, or did it just kind of happen and pass? Like, well, it, it was a big moment, and the next couple of months were just absolutely. He was very much on edge about whether or not, if I was going out to the garbage, whether I was coming home. Right, right. You know, because what had happened is I got off at, at you know, I was off shift at ten o'clock, and I told him I'm just heading out to, I'm just taking the garbage out. And he asked if he could wait up to 
to uh, say goodnight when I got back in. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Well, I come back in, and, you know, long story short, he was already in bed. So I didn't think anything of it. I went to bed. When I got up in the morning, he came flying out of his bedroom, and the first thing he said after he wrapped his arms around me was, he, he wraps his arms around me and goes, you came back. I went, uh, yeah, I just went out to take garbage. And he goes, yeah, but Dad, were you taken last night? I says, yeah, why? He says, well, I stayed up until 2 o'clock, and I, I just couldn't <laughs> stop any longer. Right. So, I, I, like I told him, I said, look, I told you I've been being taken for years. He goes, yeah, yeah but Dad, I didn't believe you. So that was like the... Yeah, that was like the slap in the face moment, the aha moment. So. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it was something bizarre because he doesn't panic about it. He knows it happens now. He just goes with it. Like he'll watch the watch the, the moon now and go yeah. to his activity. I guess you're going to work. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's amazing. Yeah. See, my son is still young enough that. Nicole, just one, one second here. Uh, one of you has your speakers a little too high. We're getting some echo feedback coming through, if you don't mind. And uh, appreciate that. Go ahead, Nicole. Um, I was going to say my son's still young enough that, I mean, he comes to me and describes strange things to me and he's thankfully old enough. Now he can speak more clearly and, um, we can work out some things or at least have a half conversation about it. But I mean, I kind of look at it as my job right now is to just, let him bring things up and discuss it. And it's my job to just kind of document everything. You know, I write down, he's got a dream journal that we keep. And then of course, you know, he's told me some other stories and he, he talks about a past life that he knows that he's had. And yeah, it's just some things that you can't write off as just, silly kid things that I try to keep track of. And I, you know, one day he'll probably be like, mom, my mom's nuts. <laughs> Let's never talk about UFOs. But at least for the time being, you know, like he knows what I do with Grant and he knows um, certain things, I would say. Like he's, he's, <clears throat> we're comfortable with discussing ufology in my house. So whoever's around, like, so he does like join in like and has has like his opinion on things already, which I think is delightful. But I don't ever, you know, I'm not like, hey, get over here and let's watch this abduction video together or listen to this or that. You know, I mean, there obviously there's things that any parent would shelter a child from, you know. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's where you, you really have to, you know, as we know, you can't exactly protect them as in stop it from happening. Right. But by having the open discussions with them, what you can do is help them cope with the idea that these are just people. They right. look a little different. They've got different outlooks on life, but they are just people. Uh well, what I've noticed is that most of the time he's telling me things like that. Like he, when he was really young, he used to describe um, in one of his dreams that this octopus-like alien, and he called him an alien, would visit him and they would talk and sometimes they would play. And I was like, ooh, an octopus alien that sounds kind of creepy or scary and he's like no mom it just looks a little weird you know I found that he was telling me things like that you know as I was trying to gauge if he was you know what his kind of emotions were while he was telling me about these things but <laughs> you know as a as a mom I never wanted like add to any kind of fear he might already have or any anxiety, you know? So a lot of times I'm just kind of like, Oh, well, that's, that's really interesting. What else can you tell me about it? But he's never come to me in an afraid moment. You know what I mean? He's never been like this happened and I was scared, you know, 
he's only had like one nightmare in his life that he talks about and it's not anything that i would consider like high strangeness or the phenomenon related so i mean i maybe i would discuss it some other time but <laughs> He'll kill me for these conversations now. When he's oh, like, oh, yes. Remember, no. YouTube is forever. I know, and that's great. Like, we're 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 already a UFO family, so. <laughs> yeah, but he's going to be like, when he hits about 14, 15, he's going to be like, Mom, shut the hell up. <laughs> shut the hell up. I'm trying to get friends, Mom. I'm trying to get a girlfriend. <laughs> you know, whatever it may be. I'm just teasing. Yeah, if he can find somebody he can deal with this, he's got to keep her. <laughs> Very true. Trying to deal with Nicole is difficult. You're right, Keith. <laughs> hey, I, I won't deny it. I will not deny that. <laughs> You're trying to get me in trouble, aren't you, Dave? Yes, yes, I am. You know, but, but when it comes to children, you know, we all as parents want to play that mama bear or papa bear, Keith, in regards to protecting our children from anything that could put them in harm's way or anything that we consider abnormal like extraterrestrial contact. I mean, how often is this happening and parents have absolutely no clue, Keith? I couldn't even begin to give you a percentage on that one. Kids are taken more often than, I mean, I know mine were taken, um, especially my, my eldest was taken a lot. Because a lot of the time, what I find, one of the, of the giveaways, one of the commonalities, if you will, is that they will talk about something looking through the window, where there's no way that you can chalk it up to a, you know, it can't be a branch because you don't have branches out there, or what have you. And they're ta mm -hmm. they talk about something coming through the window or being at the window. And it could go, of course, we have the traditional in the closet and under the bed thing. You know, a lot of the time, these are simply the way the kid manages to translate what they're seeing. You know, mm -hmm. and you'll get, you'll see it in some of the in the, some of the drawings and what have you that they do. Now, granted, they use color. The drawing may not be that well, but you look at the basic forms, and you'll find that they are they are indicative of some of the of the creatures that we're dealing with. Yeah, my son has just started getting to an age where he, well, I can't say an age. He is just finally interested in like crayons and drawings. And it's been fun trying to keep track of his artwork. He's been more of like the collage sort of artist. Like, you know, he puts different things together. It was never really drawing. And now it, it's steering that way. So it's kind of neat. Grant has started collecting some of William's pictures. and <laughs> So has he gotten to the point of actually liking to eat the things yet? You know, mm. he hasn't said that directly to me. And we don't really say taken. We say visited or shown. I was referring to eating the care of the crayons. Oh, what with the crayons? What? He wants to know if your son has uh, found a favorite color of crayon to eat. Oh, no, not eat. He doesn't. He's never been an eater. He doesn't eat weird things or put them in his mouth. But he loves the color blue. If I don't like make him do stuff with other colors, that everything everywhere will be blue all the time. So <laughs> that's his favorite color. So in regards to to parents out there, if they have an inkling uh, that their child may be taken, whether they are an experiencer themselves or whether they are, you know, have nothing to do with this outside of a, a potential interest of the topic, how can one tell if your child is being taken? From my standpoint, it really boils down to you watch what they're talking about. You know, are they are they talking about about and noises at the window when you don't have anything functional? Like if you don't have any trees near your window and you're hearing scratching at the window, mm -hmm. you may be dealing with a with a it's a it's a possible that you're dealing with with a taken. The other thing to really watch for is more 
when they're outside, daytime or nighttime, it'll be more often night, if they're constantly looking around, and especially if they're looking upwards, you know, at the rooftops or at the treetops, and they're looking a little edgy, you're likely looking at a problem. Mm. You See, know, I, don't, I don't know if I could be as specific with Keith, but I mean... I would say whether you suspect anything or not, I I think journaling your children or journaling your child's <clears throat> early years is kind of interesting in and of itself. I mean, it's a special time in their life and it's fun to document it. But if you do something as simple as a dream journal or just a, a day journal and let them express themselves, I think maybe you would see something that would give you cause to have suspicion. I don't think this would just be out of the blue for you in any way, shape or form, but I think a journal would be a great way to start. And since I'm a book reader and collector and now co-author, I would suggest looking into like the work of Barbara Lamb because I mean, just, that that's what she does and working with children and yeah, that would be a great place or resource to start. And I guess on another level is I, I do belong to sort of a moms and ufology unofficial group. And some of us, you know, we obviously talk about our children all the time, but um, you know, we, we've gotten to a point with understanding the phenomenon or how to interact with it that we've realized there's been moments where, you know, like I, I had a moment where I was seeing these shapes in, in meditation and I would be able to ask those shapes to become more defined or clear or closer to me. So just kind of like that realization of knowing that you do have a hand in this phenomenon was kind of like a clicking point for me to where when I did have my suspicions, it's like I had this moment where I talked to the universe or to the phenomenon. And I said, like, please never scare my son. Like, if you're going to interact please don't ever scare him. And that was when he was fairly young. Um, I would say just over a year old. And I think I was just having a moment where, you know, I didn't know what to expect. You know, you hear about these things running in your family and I've tried to dig into like generations before myself and, you know, you can't help but wonder. So I think maybe it was my way of casting like a safety net in some way, shape or form, because my son hasn't had, like I said, that scary moment where he's come to me frightened or confused about things. What he has described to me has, like I said, it's more often than not, like he's correcting me in some sort of way. And he's honestly like kind of, excited about it you know he's like this this is what I dreamed last night or this is what I was told or things like that and he's an inventor he builds stuff so a lot of it is like I'll ask him you know oh well come do something else and he's like no I can't stop until this part is done because that that's the part I can't forget you know what I mean and it's like there's just something a little fun and odd there that I know to just duly note. So, yeah, that's where it gets interesting, <laughs> Keith. We got uh, twenty five seconds. Absolutely. I was I was just gonna say. Um, oh. Calls octopus. Mm-hmm. You know, the the race he's dealing with are are the Udina. Oh well, you'll have to spell that out for me. Write it down and send me an email. <laughs> And on that note, I'm going to get you guys to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection, joined by co-author of a brand new book with Greg Cameron. She is an author now, Nicole Sackage. Really appreciate her jumping in as a special guest. Your questions, put them in capital letters if you're in one of our chat rooms. We'll be back 
right after this. Space Down Radio. I wonder where Nicole went. I don't know. Maybe she was taken. That was weird. Uh, yes, your, 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 your speaker is a little high still. We're still getting some feedback. That's cute. I haven't touched the thing. How's that work? Mm, no idea. Well, I've turned it down a little. You get abducted there, Nicole? I don't know. I went to close the, my chat was frozen on the side of the screen, and I thought I went to close it, but I think it just shut off everything. So, Oh, Fap said he, he took you. Oh, oh, thank you, Fap. Thanks for returning me <laughs> unharmed. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't like to emphasize anything about it, but there is tech glitchiness that happens you guys often. you guys chat i'm gonna quickly go throw some water on my face honestly i am <laughs> tired i'll be right back okay okay yeah, you know he's tired when he passes out before the show and if he falls asleep it's just it's gonna be the keith and nikki show for however long <laughs> <laughs> we won't be able to log out of anything so <laughs> oh sure you will you just shut your computer off it'll drop it <laughs> Maybe for us, but not for him. They'll just YouTube can listen to Dave snore for a few hours. No, it, it's funny. I was, um, yeah. It's just the moment you said octopus. It's like I've got those people already listed, and then it dawned on me because yeah. the octopus are one raid. I, there's one one raid. Call him the, he started by calling them the tentacles. He's like the, the tentacle ones, the you know the tentacle guys, and now have you, ever, have you ever seen the show Arrival? Yes. You remember the tall line, the tall septopods? Yep. Those are are Udina. Oh, interesting! Interesting. Yeah, well, that, that's he hasn't really spoken bad. about them in a in a well probably. Almost a year, because it was, yeah, sorry, I'm gauging my time, but um, I would say overlapping and now more dominantly, he talks about this past life when he was a wolf. Where he was a witch? Where he was a wolf. To me, and, that wouldn't make, uh, make a lot, that wouldn't be a surprise. And so, I mean, it's kind of this anthology right now of like wolf adventures and <laughs> things like he, he realized, um, which was a big moment. And I don't mean to like smile. I smile because it was kind of cool, but he came to me and this has been like the most upset or bothered he's been by telling me anything, but he had to tell me that he knew when he died as a wolf he knew he knew how he died and how his whole pack died and he needed to tell me how that happened and, yeah and i mean that takes us into a whole different realm mm -hmm. you know past lives are are a real fascinating little situation but right. i really strongly recommend that you get him either document it for him or get him to document it Mm -hmm. Oh, we kind of do both. Like, I don't try to do it in like an overbearing way. You know, it's more or less like part of our wake up routine now. It's like if if he did have a dream or can remember anything, he talks to me about it. You know, but this could be after like actual bedtime or like a nap time or oh yeah, just know. make crib notes as it were. <laughs> yeah, but I try to document as much as I can. You know, things like that. So. <laughs> Yeah, because what you'll find, and this is why I, I take all of mine just as, okay, that's the way mm -hmm. they are, is because the number of people I've run into um, where it comes to past lives have been documented by other people recognizing me from another time frame. Right. And when he was younger, before this wolf past life, like, 
he he told me some pretty interesting things about my own great grandfather. So that was a lot that that's really when I honestly started recording um, as much as I do is when some things like that hit home and I was able to check them out. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, didn't just come out of nowhere. Like, and yeah, that blew my mind. And, and that's, that's where the issue with trying to protect your kids from, from abduction is number one, you can't. All right, guys, we got like five seconds. Thank you to Michael times two chef is filth, Jason, Laura, Carl and uh, Kat for the super chats. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. Really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Thank you to everyone tuning us in around the world. And remember, all of our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button, our website, spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Tonight, we have our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection with special guest Nicole Sackage, where we take your questions and ask them if they're about UFOs, if they're about extraterrestrials, ET contact, your children, are they in contact with aliens? We'll find out tonight. Keith, we're going to start off with a question from Nikki here, and she is asking, did any kids you know or did you know when you were little and being taken? Did you try to hide in closets or under beds in kid thought, thinking that would help you hide from the ETs, Keith? No, because, I mean, I'm an odd, an odd case there, because I ran into my first set of ETs while I was still in, well, I actually ran into them while I was in utero, but the day I was born, I ran into my first set. So they've just been part of the normal thing. I can speak to that a little bit and say, yes, with the number of experiencers and parents that I've spoken with, when they speak about their own experiences as a child, you know, whether it's ongoing or it's just one memory that they recall, like, you know, you do come across these patterns and whether it's a closet or under a bed, sometimes it's not necessarily hiding. Sometimes it's waking up in those places. You know what I mean? Like in a strange place and not in a bed. You get used to Yeah. And that's what, you know, you find with a lot of children you know, as talking about it as adults, you know, when they do go to their grownups, it's like a sleepwalking scenario, like, oh, yeah, you know, kids sleepwalk or kids fall out of their bed, you know, things like that. So. Yeah, when you talk about waking up, I did that quite a lot. And it was funny because I'd I'd wake up in the wrong bed. I was in a in a room. (laughs) Like I had five brothers, well, four brothers, and we all slept in the same room, in one double bunk and one triple bunk, right? And it was weird because I'd end up in the wrong bed. Mm -hmm. And then there's the classic. um, You hear about people waking up and their clothes are inside out or backwards, or like both the legs are in one pant. (laughs) <laughs> you know, like yeah, I swear like time they have no clue how to get these clothes back on. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, she was asking if maybe you'd encountered other children while you were taken. Like I have come across a few accounts where people find themselves later in life and they can correlate their abductions. Oh and yeah, I've had them too. Yeah, uh, there's been a a number of where people were returned in other people's clothes. Yeah, so yeah. just just one one thing, Keith. When uh, it bleeds over, we can't hear what you're saying when Nicole is speaking. So go ahead, Nicole. Oh, I I think um, what was I saying? Oh, there's accounts where people find themselves older in life and recall with other experiencers that they have met in their experiencers as children. And sometimes 
children or adults even find themselves returned in not their clothing, somebody else's clothing. So you cannot, you come across these cases. I, I mean, I know there's, you can dig on your own in, you know, places like MUFON or I'm sure you can ask researchers like Preston Dennett or Grant, like Grant and Preston both seem like you mentioned one oddity and they've come across like 10 cases that they could cite where it's so similar. So it's fascinating. All right, let's get to another question. Greg Moyes is asking, Keith, are you friends with any Arboreans? What are they like? Actually, there's, they are, they're an, and the answer to the question is yes. And for the most part, they're actually really friendly individuals. They are actually literally how I get a lot of my communication lines. Like instead of watching newspaper, I talk to these guys and they, because they're connected throughout the planet. Right. But they are on the whole very gentle. You know, very gentle, very patient individuals. But I'll tell you, trying to get them to say anything can take a month of Sundays. Why are they difficult? Because unlike like humans are very fast-paced, very skittish, right? Arboreans, on the whole, are very laid back and just, they're just not in a hurry. Mm. What do they look like? In simplest terms, trees, ferns, flowers... Okay, now not every tree is an arborean. Okay, and not every fern is one. Weird. Okay. Very weird. If you think of it in terms of, if we take a look at it from from the Tolkien world, treants are actually, well, what they are is they are the arboreans. I am Groot. I guess so. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> That's That's not, I am Groot. They I don't grow that fast. For five more minutes. <laughs> All right, let's get to another question. Mennonite Abe is asking, have either of you had any ghost activity in addition to alien activity? Is there a connection? Well, the first question, when the first answer would be absolutely. We've got a resident ghost that's a pain in the neck on occasion. And, but the only connection that I found between them, because some ghosts are human or were human, some are different races. Right. And that is my call. Keith will have to uh, take that because he still is working on shift. Nicole, have you ever had anything like that happen? Um, you know, I don't like making it sound so scary. Um. I think ghost activity sounds like a, you're being haunted. I I have had moments throughout my life as a child and as an adult where I, I believe I've been visited by family members' spirits. Now, have I seen the ghost of my grandma? No. But this, you know, an overwhelming presence. And I think once you recognize it as such, you know, I, I think... That's something that's very special, you know, and I, I do have one, I call it one of my scary, you know, high strangeness moments. And it, it involved a Ouija board and playing around with it and talking with things. And yeah, I mean, it spooked us at the moment or spooked me, but it was nothing terrifying. And yes, I do think there's a level of how this is all connected, you know, and you start seeing similarities when you start listening to testimony from this paranormal world. You, you see the, the likenesses in the ufology stories as well. Just when it comes to um, like channeling stories and out-of-body experiences being so paralleled with um, abduction scenarios or contact testimony. And, yeah, it's it's fascinating to me. So See, I, I, I completely yeah. agree. I think, that, yeah. uh, I think that there are a lot of coincidences that happen between the paranormal and the ufological. I know for me personally, my scenario when I started awakening into this entire field it all started very paranormally. 
And then mm -hmm. as I started to open up, that's when more started coming through, like the UFOs and the extraterrestrials. This is why I always tell our audience, if you're going to follow people, follow people who are investigating the entire phenomena. You know, mm -hmm. I always brag about your boss, Grant Cameron, because a lot of people will say, well, there goes Grant again on one of his tangents or on one of his uh, his goose chases. You know, yeah. but, but the one thing Grant does, along with people like David Weatherly or Timothy Renner or people of that ilk, is they follow the path until that path becomes a dead end. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we do that enough in this field because the big name researchers who are not out there for fame, they're not out there for fortune, they're actually out there trying to find proper answers to these phenomena. They are the ones who are are looking, f you know, for those connections that seem to be there. Because people who are experiencing the high strangeness always tend to, Nicole, seem to have ghostly encounters, cryptid encounters, as right. well as UFO and alien encounters as well. It's always running the gamut of two of the three, maybe three of the three, not just one. Have you noticed that? Yes, I I have definitely noticed that. But I think it's something that your new person into this community doesn't really realize yet or realize about themselves, perhaps. Like, you know, it was 25 years between my first UFO sighting and my second UFO sighting. And in between that, you know, I had an out-of-body experience and that Ouija board experience as well. And it took probably 15 years for those, the, the UFO stuff, the paranormal stuff, and the out-of-body experience. It took years for those three things to click for myself. And I experienced it. But, you know, you eventually find your way through it. And I think that's why, like you mentioned, Grant, I think it's people that have the diligence to not only dive into these topics, but stick with them longer than a month. You know what I mean? Like Grant's invested so many decades into some facets of his research that, you know, I can only hope that my research can last that long and go as far, you know, because like you said, until you come up against that dead end, then you're still on the search you have and we know so often we wind up with more questions instead of any answers so and until you run out of questions to chase down then you got to keep going <laughs> even have, if you yeah, have to yeah, back yeah. burner it for a while you got to keep going you definitely have to keep it going because that's the only way that you're going to lead and this is why like i said you know whether it's grant or whether it's david weatherly timothy renner joshua cutchin names that I mention quite often on this show, you have to be able to chase those those paths. You know, mm -hmm. as I've stated to our listeners for years, the minute you go down the rabbit hole in this field, it's like you open that door. And behind that door, there is 10 more doors. And behind each yeah. of those 10 doors, when you open the door, there's 10 doors each behind those 10 doors. And it right. keeps going and going and going. And this is why when I hear people insulting people like Grant or people insulting uh, others who are, who are taking those paths to see where they go, they have no clue or understanding that those paths have to come to an end one way or another. Mm -hmm. This is why, mm -hmm. if you look at Grant, who's a perfect example of this, this is why he goes off on consciousness or another path of people who claim to fly the ships or what does music have to do with ufology or what what does, uh, you know, any type of psych, uh, psilocybin have to do with or, or uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Any type of psychedelic drug have to do with contact? Mm -hmm. What do uh, family lineage have to do with contact? These are all different lanes and there's hundreds of them, yeah. hundreds of lanes. And people like Grant are only at maybe 20, 30 lanes. <laughs> right. I know. And that's why, you know, 
I joke with Grant, you know, it's like he has to have a team of assistants or, you know, helpers along. I, I, I did this for so long all alone by myself, you know, just as like my hobby or my, you know, closeted addiction, whatever you want to call it, you know, and you know, once I joined the social media side of this and really took that step forward and into, I'm going to put my voice to this, you know, it's just amazing because it is that double-edged sword. You get the negativity for what you want to look into because you actually start caring about, you know, other people that you're interacting with and their opinions but I really can't see how anybody can do it alone anymore these days and not have at least a group of people to use as like a sounding board. You know, you do end up with this community inside a community that you end up trusting and, you know, you find the like-minded people. And that was one thing that led me to grant, you know, a lot of people that I kind of trusted from this nuts and bolts world had that opinion of Grant. They were like, well, he used to be all about presidents and now he's gone off the deep end. And to me, you know, they always said they valued my opinion because I was an experiencer, but it was fine as long as I kept it to nuts and bolts and just wondered blindly about my experience, you know, but in, and so as soon as like, I knew that about Grant, I was like, I have to, find out more about him. You know, he was the first researcher I found who, you know, had gone from this nuts and bolts side into this consciousness, it's all connected side. And why can't you, I mean, you, you can only build on research from there. After doing that, I felt like this whole other dimension of research had opened up to me and I kicked myself in the butt for being so closed minded to it for so long. So, yeah. And that's the big thing is, you know, you get these people out there in UFO land who get so offended <laughs> that people start going down all of these different paths and, and trying these different, these different avenues to try and find answers. Yet I think it's brilliant. I think yeah. it's absolute brilliance that that somebody has the the testicular fortitude, shall we say, <laughs> all right, to to move the move the ball forward. Because hey, if it's a dead end, guess what? That's perfect. Because right. now, now you can cross that off. <laughs> right? So I know we don't get to cross off enough, honestly. Like <laughs> No, but everybody is so focused. Government, 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 military, military, military. All right. Yeah. Nobody is looking for the avenues. And this is exactly what the government people are doing. They are looking at all the avenues. What happens with contact? Why are people like Samantha Mowat existing or R. Keith Andrews existing? You know, why out of nowhere does a 38-year-old chubby gray-haired white guy, you know, all of a sudden get taken? I don't know who that is, but I'm I think it, I think it might be someone that I know, all right? I mean, this is what happens out there. Right. When we uh when we try and figure out these answers because none of this makes sense. That's the only correct answer. None of it makes sense. It doesn't matter whether you're Dr. Eric Davis or you're John Alexander or you're R. Keith Andrews or you're Science Bob McGuire or you're Samantha Mowat or you're Chris Bledsoe or anybody. They are all in it together trying to figure out what is going on. And we can't close these different angles towards any sort of ET contact while this continues on. I mean, just like we were talking in the first half hour about children. I mean, is my son a contactee? I know he's been taken twice. You know, I know he hasn't been taken since because we were told that he, they weren't taking him anymore. Mm -hmm. And you got to go with that. You, yeah. Will it happen again? We don't know. As of right now, my son doesn't draw little gray guys. He doesn't draw little monsters. 
He doesn't, Mm -hmm. he doesn't, you know, and he's much like your boy, a couple years older than your boy, but you know, he, he doesn't do those, those things that we would suspect, you know? Right. So, I mean, I had one, one obvious drawing and it was, and you know how little kids can't even really draw bodies correctly. You know what I mean? Like a person just might have hands sticking out their sides, you know? So a lot of this is interpretive in itself, but he, he drew a triangle and it had the swirly, he even changed the color. There was a swirl coming down from the triangle and there was a person in it. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And even, I mean, it's a person, but it's a little kid drawing a person. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's, that's what he drew. And I of course was like, Oh my God. And just, there wasn't even a discussion along with it. He he told me this little one's going up to a bigger one. And the bigger one was so big, it didn't even fit on the page that he was drawing. There was just parts of it. That's how he said the bigger one was that big. And that's where he left it. And so it's in the stash and in the collection. And yeah. The only thing weird my little boy did it was a few years ago where all of a sudden he comes up to me and he's dad, he goes, dad, can you tell me what a donkleosteus is? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't even know how to pronounce that. Right. But, and he was like, five, just turned five. And apparently it was one of the predecessors to Megalodon. Right. And I'm like, okay, but no, That's- I'm in knowledge right there, yeah. <laughs> but on the flip side, I know my son sees things. We've caught him. Yeah. Uh, we've caught him st- him and the dog staring at a at a shadow type being in the doorway. Him mm. and I had that scenario happen a couple of years ago where I was getting him ready for uh, um, for bed and he was having a bedtime snack and all of a sudden he you know, we watch these like captain's bars go through my kitchen. These mm. giant captain's bars, they're about 18 inches each of, of barred light. And then all of a sudden, like two minutes later, he, he announces that, you know, that uh, looks at me and starts bawling his eyes out and says, Dad, you're going to die soon. I don't want you to die. Oh, yeah. You've told yeah, me. Yeah, that, that one. That one still the, gives the, me a, a little bit of the creeps. Babies. Yeah. yeah, and I have William described um, seeing some lights, and he he had come to me, and I happened to have like my phone right there with me, so I just flipped it to like record what he was saying, and he was describing orbs coming down to me, and the different colors that they were. So I was glad that I was able to record, you know, him describing it himself. So that was kind of special, but you know, what really, the one that also really got me was it was one of his inventions and he had taken apart so many things to like make this. He took apart a vacuum cleaner and an old coffee maker, coffee pot combo thing that I had and had all these tubes and different chambers connected to each other. And he even made me fill parts of it up with water for him. And then finally, when it was mostly done, because a lot of things stay in a prototype phase for a long time, he started telling me, he was like, over here is where you put in the DNA and it goes it follows through here and this is where it is synced and then it gets put into the cells that it's going to create. And he went through each chamber and he was describing to me like a maturation growing chamber. (laughs) And I was just floored and he was four, four years old. My goodness. Yeah. But your son's a genius. I don't know. He is a genius. He's going to be the biggest dumb dummy. (laughs) That's ever existed. I, I highly doubt yeah. that. There's a lot of people in, that He's we know who are scientists yes, who are going to study different. Smart fun, but... Nicole Sackage, R. Keith Andrews.
The ET Connection with our Keith continues on Spaced Out Radio with our two next. We'll take your questions as well, so put them in capital letters if you're in the chat room or on Twitter. We'd appreciate that. We'll be back right after this. Oh. You awake yet? <laughs> Almost. Almost. Come on, pup. Well, Keith is still busy, so we're going to remove him for the time being. I'm letting my dog out this time. Okay, I got your mic on. My mic's on. I'm letting my dogs out this time. I'll be right back. Okay, YouTube, I just had a serious scare. <laughs> I let my dog out my front door. And I have a big, open, open cemetery, pitch black next to me. No neighbors. And my dog runs out in the yard. And like three feet away from me, I hear something go. <laughs> and I froze like this. And I turned. And I could see the silhouette of two deer ears <laughs> and a profile of this deer. And there was like five of them. And they all went eh, eh, like to each other and then ran off like, oh, my God. Definitely don't have aliens tonight unless it's a pack of or a herd of deer. So <laughs> we'll ask our Keith if that can be a screen image and how often it's used. So. <laughs> Oh, too funny. I'm just glad I didn't scream like a girl. <laughs> it was a little creepy, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but and at, in hindsight, I was glad my dog did not see or hear them. He's like the biggest dumb dog ever because, yeah, he would have chased him and been gone. So, Fap, that was not you in the bushes. <laughs> All right, Keith, are you back? Yeah, he's back. We'll add him to the show. I'll go. <clears throat> 
Okay, shh, YouTube. That was my Four. little story for you. I'm not even going to tell them. Five, okay. All right. That's fine. <laughs> Hold on. Keith is not done. Uh, all right. Uh, Drake C., how are you? Jesse Peak, good to have you here. Oh, Hexstar, Oumuamua. Trinitro, how are you? Philip Bacon. No, Philip Baca, pardon me. Um... <laughs> What the hell was that? Oh, hey, I have, an, I have an inside joke with YouTube now. Perfect. I'll just go back on the replay and find it. Yep. Uh-huh. 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 It's going to be that way. Oob, Joe's Bane, you've got aliens. And uh, oh, I think I'm finally starting to wake up. <clears throat> It was a female. I, yeah. <laughs> Keith, are you back? All right, he's back. Phone could be thrown over my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> That's just likely to break it. Mm. Uh, Evil Carl says he is Chad Smith. Hi, Chad. Yes. Chad Smith is the only not Chad Smith here. <laughs> All right, we got 20 seconds here. A big thank you to Vinster, Ozzy, Steve, Apollo, Michael, Times Two, uh, Chefist, Dirty Filth, Jason, Laura, Carl, and Kat for the amazing super chats. It's a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. And uh, here we go, everyone. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this planet we call Earth. And we want to remind you that you can tune us in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club, Terrasis. Terrasis is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection. Keith comes in once a month near the beginning to discuss everything weird, strange with extraterrestrials and UFOs. Now, of course, we are joined by Nicole Sackich, co author of Grant Cameron's new book and a great researcher in her own. She's just not a cook anymore, people. She's got a new title. And we love her for it. Hey, guys, welcome back. Great to be back. I missed you, Keith, by the way. Oh, my apologies. One of the drawbacks of my actual job. No, I meant just in the last month or two. I've missed you. And in the last five minutes. <laughs> All right. Let's get to a question from Vinny. Our Keith, have you ever heard about the Sun Simulator? I've heard about it. You know, there's a there's a neat little a neat little concept out that the whole thing is a hologram and that we're just this incredible computer program, which is a wonderful thought made for an excellent movie and is about as as full of holes as it can get. Mm. I also heard tell at one point of people saying that we were actually living inside a Dyson sphere. Mm. I've heard this interesting theory, and Dave, maybe you can help me with it a little bit, where there's some technique that if you're looking at the sun but not really looking at the sun, there's a like a photographic technique where you can see this. They call them sun ships, I believe, to where it looks like you can see 
orbs or ships that are around the sun. It wouldn't be surprising. There's a planet inside the sun's photosphere called Vulcan. Ah, yes. And there's an entire right. interstellar fleet inside the, the sun's um, corona. Hmm. How do they not burn up? They got much better air, co- air conditioners than we got. <laughs> I, I would assume that. Jennifer is asking, Are Keith, hello, is it sometimes hard to tell a hybrid from a human? For who? <laughs> Sorry. For me, they stand out pretty solidly. For most people, yeah, it's very hard. And contrary to some people's opinion, most hybrids don't even have a clue they are one. Mm. It's very much like most people that are adopted have no clue they were adopted. I have heard that there is a hybrid slash alien detector. I have not been able to verify that its use is true or that it is an actual um, thing. But well, I've come up across it a couple times now. And technically well, the answer would be yes. If you if you can if you can track the subquantum biomagnetic flux on an individual and compare it to a phenomenal database you'd be able to spot hybrids via some sort of a detector. Hmm. Well, this was supposedly being used in the 80s and probably the 90s. And if you believe the line that it's probably still in use today. So I'm still big and I'll keep everything updated on that one. (laughs) All right, let's move on here to the next question. Weird one from Greg. Do the aquatic elephant race have a leader? How do they choose them? Well, first of all, it's a matriarch. And how they choose them is, is in a, it's very similar to the way the elephants do it. You know, it really does boil down to the largest of them and the largest and wisest. It's not always the biggest. But they do it primarily on the intellectual battlefield. Oh, okay, yeah, I know that sounds a little odd, but they actually go after the bri- after the brighter ones. But they're a very passive race anyway. So, but yeah, they're very much a matriarchal society. Elephant race, Nicole. Elephant I, race. I just like the matriarchal side. That's yay, elephant race. <laughs> <laughs> Evil Carl. Is asking, I heard Earth had two moons. One got destroyed. Do you know anything about this, Keith? Well, in the time I've been here, I've only seen the one. I know that sounds a little odd, but you got to remember, I've got memories that date back to the construction of the planet. It is strange. It is strange. My life's always been strange, though, Dave. This is true. This is true. I can't cite the exact study, but I know there has been like models and renditions of like the history of our solar system. And a few of them have encompassed like even a, a like Earth One. And there were multiple objects around like Earth One and there were collisions. And, you know, there's a possibility that our moon now is like a chunk from the old earth. And, you know, there, there are some science models out there that theorize that there were other bodies in orbit around our earth at certain phases in the solar system development. So I won't argue the theories because I got nothing to work with. I will tell you that this is not the first time the mankind has made it into outer space. Hmm. That's interesting to hear. I immediately like thought, well, duh, the Atlanteans, but I don't know why I thought that. <laughs> well, the Atlanteans didn't come from Earth to start with. Hmm. But the, the ones that are, are a dead giveaway are the Mobians, who actually left Earth. Where are they now? A Mobius. Where's Mobius? Mobius oh. is actually a planet that, and ironically enough, NASA knows about it. Ooh. But they are, Mobius is a, is a planet roughly the same size as Earth on the exact same orbital path 
180 degrees across the across the sun. Do so they Earth will never see Mobius. Do they come back and visit? Yes. What, are we? Do we go there? Like that you said, NASA knows about Mobius. Do we go there? NASA knows about them. Um, NASA keeps trying to deny a lot of things that NASA knows about. But do I know for certain whether they go? I know that I know that Mobius does have visitors over there. Whether it's NASA that goes or not, I have no way of telling. Right. What kind of technology do they have or use? Do they come via ship or do they portal jump or? No, they do come via ship, but it's their ability to manipulate what humans call zero point energy that makes them dangerous. Mm. Except they're extremely peace loving. They do not have war. They do not have have disease. They don't have jealousy or greed. Is that why they left Earth? Were they like well, a breakaway civilization? In a manner of speaking, they they made a mistake. Okay. They literally had, at the time, they had 10 billion people on this planet. Mm-hmm. And they made a miscalculation. Their civilization almost died overnight because of one minor miscalculation, well, pretty major miscalculation. And the remainder of them, all but about 10,000 of, of them, left Earth altogether and went over and moved on to Mobius. Mm. And they haven't repeated the same mistake now that they're Mobians and not Earthlings? Well, they were they corrected the problem here. This is why I tell people humans can actually get along. It is possible. It's been done before. But no, the Mobians took their, their civilization as it was. They didn't create the same mistake because the mistake they made um, the biggest mistake they made was they didn't think through one little thing, and it's it's a long story to get to it. But the thing they didn't t- that they didn't do was they never thought about the consequences. They had their entire civilization built on on physical manifestation mm-hmm. and sustained by psychic energy. Well, the idea came up, and we we never did figure out who actually came up with the idea. You know, whether it was male, female, child, what have you, to stop everybody's heart at the same time just to see what would happen. Really bad thought. Yeah, Never that, thought that. it through. So they did it, and they literally killed off half the population in a heartbeat. Get you every time. Get you every time. Kira is asking, can you please describe characteristics of hybrids? Well, that's going to be a very dishy issue. It depends on what they are hybridized from. But the biggest thing, one of the most common phenomenon is they will not mesh with modern society very well. Like there will be something distinctly different about their behavioral pattern, not in a negative way, like we're not talking sociopathic difference, right? But they, there will be major, major differences in the way they look at the world that will not be compatible with the environment or the circumstances under which they grew up. Ufologist is asking, is Vulcan full of plasma beings, or how does it work? Vulcan is a crystalline is a crystalline race. You know, they are they are not they are not green men with, with gray with green blood. You know, or pointy ears in green blood. Vulcans <laughs> are a crystalline race. All right. Okay. Jesse is asking, are you familiar, Keith, with crypto terrestrials? Be like a, uh, like, a presuming, like a cryptid that's not from here. Uh, they, well, they do exist. There's no question there. Cryptids basically boil down to something that doesn't fit the standard evolutionary path of a given planet. And virtually every planet has them. That it? Done? I've been watching the reboot of Masters of the Universe, and you look through some of the characters in that, and you know that that's set, like, 
in its own like different planet and universe and you're like whoa there's a dog man whoa there's a bunny man whoa there's a <laughs> it's great <laughs> yeah I, I i never liked that cartoon it's so weird that's why it's still great bugs <laughs> still bugs me honestly yeah i gave up on modern television for the most part <laughs> I haven't, I haven't actually had television itself in probably five years now. Right. This is streaming on Netflix now. It's a reboot from my childhood, so I have to, you know, watch it. <laughs> and uh, it's weird. All right. Vinny is asking, are ghosts or demons related to aliens? Um. Well, some aliens become ghosts, and demons, or more to the point, demons, are another race altogether. And because they are not from Earth, they qualify very clearly as as um, alien. But they are not what people are taught to believe. I've come and, across quite a few stories, too, where in um, like some seance circles where they're speaking with spirit and it's an E.T. spirit, like, you know. They oh, do yeah. have a way, they have a life cycle, they've moved into the spirit world. So that's that blew my mind when I first came across those stories. Well, so. the thing is, humans, whether you're good or bad, plants, animals, aliens, um, elementals, different energy patterns, all end up going to the same place when they die. Mm -hmm. All of them do. Fascinating. Yeah. You know, which makes for a rather entertaining time over there. My favorite um, to follow right now is Dr. Shirley Ryan. And she channels a being who is in spirit, um, whose name is Thanes. And Thanes has passed on into the spirit world and Shirley channels. So it's wonderful. I, I love following along with their knowledge and story. So Shirley, you can't be serious. Surely I am. <laughs> Nikki is asking, Keith, do you have memories of past lives of being an extraterrestrial? Yes. <clears throat> I've got memories that date back literally before this universe was born was created was born. Wow. Okay. Um I remember like well that goes back a bit. See, understanding that I take a look at the Big Bang Theory, I refer that as a, to that as a flip because it has happened more often than you care to count. But if we go back half a dozen flips, right, I remember being on a, I remember being on a, on a planet with something, with herds of animals that just, I'm working on a, on getting the description together for them. But the reason I haven't included them in Race of the Worlds is because they are not in existence anymore. Hmm. You know, um, but no, I, I do remember being on other planets on in other in other forms. I mean, one of the first ones I one of the most recent ones was actually before Earth was born it was was built. And that was as a as a info. I was an info an information handler for the for the Zerzix. I was the Zerzix and handled the information flow. And that I mean, basically, I worked in a mail room. Where the Zerzix not necessarily the most exciting place to work. Did they build the earth? I love it. You've said that before, before with the, when the earth was built. And like, I automatically think of like the planet builders from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and the character named Slarty Bartfest. So is there like a Slarty Bartfest out there that like designed like the, the, the coastline of the UK, like while they were building our planet? Like... You no, know, the coastline of the UK is quite frankly an evolutionary problem mm -hmm. of the current Caboran that we're living on. So but the answer to your question is no, the Xerxes did not build Earth. Mm -hmm. So who did? Who built it? Well, the, it was a group of spirits. It was actually a pair of spirits that built it. Oh. The, the ones that ended up 
building the original race that was here, which would be the Elfid, was the spirits or were the spirits that built the Earth in the first place. All right, we got four and a half minutes before we have to go to break at the bottom of the hour. Our Keith Andrews and special guest Nicole Sackage here tonight for the ET Connection. Cat Chaser is asking, are aliens a Bigfoot connected, Keith? Only in a manner of speaking. The, the Bigfoot itself came from here. The Wara, which looks very similar to the Bigfoot, is an off-worlder. It is an alien. And a whole lot more aggressive than what, the, than what Bigfoot is. All right. But that's about where the connection ends. All right. Jennifer is asking, in some stories from different cultures, there are reports of two suns seen together in the sky. What's your thoughts, Keith? Well, bearing in mind that all people that are from and that are living here now, or for that matter, that settled here, didn't come from from this world. Many of these of these comments, you know, many of these stories likely come from their planet, because Earth itself only has the one sun. You know, it's in everything I've ever seen leaves Earth itself as a soul as a singular star. Not a binary star where one of them faded. Because had we had two suns and one of them went missing, it would have wiped life out on the planet entirely. Just so negative. So negative. <laughs> All right, let's burn through a couple more here. Apollo is asking, which species is the most similar to us? The Mobians. <laughs> Sorry, they came from Earth. They went to Mobius. They will pass for humans quite readily because, frankly, they're built exactly from a physiological standpoint. They're built exactly the same way. You know, but there's a number of races that can pass for for humans, but those are the most similar. All right. What's the next similar? Who are the other ones that can pass? Well, the Nordics can pass. You know, the Nordics tend to be a little taller, a little broader, but they can pass for humans without any real problem. And this is why they're trained to work the way they are. All right. You know, of course, then when you, when you, if you actually look at the Venusians, the Venusians are very similar in configuration. Their physiology is a whole different ballgame. But mm -hmm. from an appearance standpoint, they look very similar. Orions look similar, but they're the wrong color. And rest assured, we're not talking brown. <laughs> All right. Final question here. So we've got about just over 90 seconds. Lazarus is asking, what do you think about the Black Knight satellite? Well, I'm going to have to get clarification. Well, basically, there's this big piece of space debris that many people out there have nicknamed the Black Knight, believing that it's an alien satellite that roams around Earth and patrols and, and sets off alien signals. Well, in, it's a cute thought. I have no question there are alien satellites out, but mankind ain't going to see them. I think the Black Knight is a space blankie. It's it's the cover that blew off the thing that they said it did. I got excited. I wanted it to be an alien satellite, but from what I dug in into and saw and found out and followed, that's that was that's one of those dead ends, Dave, that we talked about. They only they happened so few and far between. Like that was one I felt satisfied with closing the book on. Honestly, like yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm I'm good with that one. Yeah, me yep. too. I believe it is a piece of space debris that comes from Earth as well, and I don't believe that it is anything alien or supernatural or extraterrestrial or interdimensional. Or anything like that. So, uh, sorry to be the bearers of bad news. I do apologize with that. Evil Carl, we'll have to wait for your question when we come back from the break at the bottom of the hour. The ET connection with Art Keith Andrews and Nicole Sackage happens right after this. We bring in Art Keith once a month to 
break down everything woo as we ride the train towards the stars and see where it turns up. And your questions are always welcome here on Spaced Out Radio. We continue with the ET Connection. The lovely and talented Nicole Sackage. She's an author now. And Nicole's uh, joined by the man, the myth, and the legend, Archie Hand. I'm so excited. Pascal just entered the chat room. My shoulder feels better today. Thank you again, Carl, for that awesome super chat. And Pascal, thank you for the super chat. Really do appreciate that. All right, I am way back in the chat room right now, guys, because I'm holding uh, for questions here for Keith. Uh, let's see here. Let's see where we are. Bonjour, Pascal. Comment ça va? Uh, see if I miss any. Blackbird Immaculate, how you doing? Good to see you. Diecast and racing. Good to have you back. And uh, Dirty Filth. You're looking extra dirty tonight. And uh, who else do we have here? And Nicole's talking. Yes, uh, Kira Pascal is my special friend, also known as Feder Mouse. I was... Are you talking to my dog? Yes. <laughs> I'm muting him now, sorry. That's okay, I like him. Grandmaster, what's happening? Welcome back. Mm-hmm. Derek Doherty, welcome to... The Spaced Out Radio Show. And, uh, man, am I way behind here. Holy cow. It's- Mark Sanchez, thanks for coming on in. Mm-hmm. I saw that question, Evil Carl. Bad, Evil Carl. Bad. Mm-hmm. Hi, Char. Stetson John, how are you? I'll get you that link right now, Stetson John. Dave is not very awake tonight. So if you haven't heard, literally, I fell asleep in my chair, which I never do in show prep. And um, I I know it was after 8 o'clock Pacific, I fell asleep. And I literally woke up with three minutes to go before we go to air. And uh, I was apparently tired. And so I've been trying to wake up ever since. We can no longer say it never happens, just it seldom happens. Oh, my goodness. But we'll get through it. Yeah, we will. We're having a good show. Uh, where is... Yeah, usually I don't get caught up in that many calls at the end of the show of the night anymore. Yeah, either. That was weird. That was weird. What's go- what's with up? What's up with that? What's up with that? Well, hi uh, Nicole uh, Sakic. Let's see how long it takes her to turn her mute button off. Well, that done. Was, that wasn't long. I'm getting. But hey, this is my third show today. I'm just you, clued you, into that. And you are that. you are Radio Gaga today. Radio. It's K- this is my first Grand Slam. First time I've done three in one day. Oh, uh, hold on. Uh, J- Gail is messaging me. She Ooh, goes, hi, Gail. Just, she goes, just read Tara's post with the two dads. You know you have an open door here to speak to me anytime. Don't waste it. I know, Captain Shirk. 
You kick my ass about that all the time. I love you, Captain Shirk. <coughs> I love Captain Shirk. She's awesome. Yeah, good old Shirky Poodles. Shirky Poodles. It's her own private dog breed, Shirky Poodles. Oh. Mm-hmm. I, I think I want one. <laughs> uh-huh. I added uh, more beans to my pet family yesterday. What, what did you get? Well, the uh, the inventor won two goldfish last night at our right. town fair. Nice. I want to get back. I want to get back into having reptiles. I really, really want a chameleon. Ooh. I love reptiles, frogs. I'd like to get some frogs in here. Love I had frogs. tadpoles last year. Do you remember? I woke up and after some thunderstorm, my pool, my neighbor's pool was full of like millions of them. Hold and on, so hold on. And I scooped some. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Here we go. Past the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Get your horns up as we get ready to kick off the second half of the show. Want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection, where Keith comes in once a month to answer all of your extraterrestrial questions. And we're also joined by Nicole Sackage, research assistant for Grant Cameron and co-author of his brand new book. And let's go to Evil Carl right off the bat here, Keith, as uh, he is asking, do the elf aliens look human or more like aliens? Well, human in as much as they're bipedal. But for the most part, they basically, if you watch, literally, if you watch Lord of the Rings, like The Hobbit, that sort of thing, you'll find what the... On the on a very uh, very basic level, you'll find what the elves look like. You know what the elven race looks like. Vulcans. <laughs> they look like Vulcans. Essentially, yes. Star Trek Vulcans, not the real ones. <laughs> Basically, yes, not the real Vulcans, but yeah. Except I I'm learning, Keith. I take these notes as we have our little. Friday night chats, and I'm I'm learning. <laughs> well, look at you, look at you. I I didn't know until recently that that Nicole has a notebook on everybody she's on the air with. She has her own library of notes. I mean, she. How many diaries have you gone through in your life? I I don't know more than five. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Why, Jay? Who's in your area, Keith of the Okanagan? Are you a proponent of the Anunnaki texts as written by Zachariah Sitchin? Well, not no. I know I've heard of Zachariah Sitchin, but not having looked at the Anunnaki texts, I cannot comment on that. All right. I think it's a great place to jump in with ufology and stuff outside of nuts and bolts history. You know, I think it's a good a good place to jump in. And expand. All right. Hexstar is asking, what is the true age of the Sphinx and who built it, Keith? Well, number one, as far as I understand it, um, given that that the pyramids are about 5,000 years old, that puts the Sphinx about fifteen to 20,000 years old. It's a pretty hard rock. Yeah, ACDC, pretty much. I think ACDC sung about that. As far as who exactly built it, that I'm not entirely certain of. I know the Mobians didn't build it because they were gone before it got here. Interesting. 
Interesting. All right. Well, let's move on to another question here as we are scrolling on down. Vinny is asking, are reptilian shapeshifters real? From everything I've seen, no. Reptilians have, they, some of the reptilian races have, um, tech, some, of the, some of the reptilian races have technology that will, that creates a hologram, but they themselves are not shapeshifters. And if you get into things like the Drakes or Zerzazian, the, um, the Tormanon, basically you're looking at reptilians that are too, brand, that are too proud to change their shape to accommodate some, uh, some other race. Especially if you talk to the Drakes, according to them, they've got the perfect, the perfect image anyway, and you guys should all be envious of them. Could be. Could very well be. All right, Greg is asking, why are the inner Earth civilizations hiding? Makes me nervous of their intentions. If, well, the nervousness of their intentions I cannot do anything about. If any one of the races, of the inner Earth races, well, any of the major inner, inner Earth races were to, were to desire to do something really negative towards the human race, the human race would be dead before it knew they were attacking. If you think about it, the Elfid race has access to what humans call true magic. The Dwarvish race can drop a city out by, from underneath you and you won't even see it happening. They call them sinkholes right now. But we're target, talking about the capacity to drop and to drop target and targeted sinkholes where they can pick a building out of the middle of the city and leave that building standing and drop everything around it. And we're not talking about just turning it into rubble. We're talking about dropping it into a hole in the ground. As for why they went underground, it's because of the fact there weren't many of them left to start with, not after the Great War. And so they left the humans on, on Bob because humans adapted faster. Net result, mankind took over the surface and became the caretakers. But as they, as they keep telling me, humans are so afraid of each other in their simple skin colors, these guys don't come up because humans kill and shoot first and go where you friendly second. That's just Texas. It has a bad habit of causing problems. <laughs> True. All right. Jack. I agree with that, yeah. I think humans are the scary ones, honestly, in a lot of cases. Of course. Well, we they're raised to be fear-based. Of course we are. Jennifer is asking, are hybrid healers special, or do they have special powers? Hybrid healers. Depending entirely on what they're hybridized from. But they certainly have, have different skills. Um, some of them do have advanced abilities that many humans would chalk up to Reiki or the like. Okay. But they are taught the hybrid healers, if you're dealing with the with more along the metaphysical side, um, usually what you'll find is that they work on the on the sub quantum levels and thereby have learned how to to help humans accelerate, or for that matter, other races. But it's done by a biometric um, biomagnetic um What's the word I'm looking for? It basically boils down to a pulse to accelerate the healing factor in the given body. All right. I don't like this question from Evil <laughs> Carl. He says, sorry, Dave. Are there any humanoid shark alien beings, Keith? Not a nice question at all. The, the ironic part of it is, if you think of an animal, the odds are there is an alien counterpart to it somewhere. Okay, but if he's referring to there was a there was a show out called called Shark Boy and Lava Girl, and that is not what you're looking at. There are there are um, there are underwater races that are not off world. They're ancient races <clears throat> that are that are from that from that genus. 
Jennifer is asking, any connection between hybrid agendas and human cloning claims put forth by certain individuals who claim to be clones, like super soldiers, celebrities, etc.? Well, we can take the hybrid agenda thing and essentially throw it out the window. As far as the human clones and the people claiming to be human clones from, you know, from the super soldier programs and what have you, the only drawback to that thing, to, to those claims, is from what I've seen, the super, the super soldier programs, you admit to me, you start spreading word that you're out there and they have a tendency of terminating you. It's not like they want that program to be publicly publicly acknowledged. By the way, uh, Evil Carl says, I swear every time I look at Keith's window, I keep seeing shapes and shadows. So strange. Maybe it's just me. No, I've got a ghost. I've got a, a number of spirits that live here. Now I have to start watching the window. Mm -hmm. I just watch it. That's just plain normal. I just watch Keith's sideburns because those are incredible. They are growing as we speak right now. <laughs> All right. Hexstar is asking, what is the purpose of the hexagon circulating on the North Pole of Saturn? I would be inclined to say being a hexagonal form, you're looking at data collection. See... The, when you're dealing with, with those kinds of forms, you're pulling in information from three different time frames at the same time. Right. Okay. It's, it's a triphasic collector. And they just simply draw the information in on a number of different levels and then, re then bounce it off to whoever's operating it. Now, usually that happens to be radio command which is the control center for that is the communication center for the for the consortium the cold comet um or youtube crowd comet it's a mobian not a nubian oh that's terrible <laughs> that's terrible big j is asking keith what do you know about phobos I haven't looked into it much. I do know my understanding of Phobos itself is it's an asteroid. But that being said, I don't have a lot to work with. Linda is asking, Keith, what do you think was here on Earth first? Was it Bigfoot or humans? Well, Bigfoot was definitely here before the humans were. You know, that, that's just a black and white for me. They weren't the first ones here, but they were here before humans. What's your thoughts, Nicole? <sighs> Bigfoot seems to be timeless. You know what I mean? Like, I agree with the probably here before humans side. Seem, seems like that. Seems like they know enough to be scared of us so or want to stay away from us. So I would say they saw us come into being, you know? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know I can't escape the man with the big feet. Like, you know? But it's been one side of this world of ufology that I've tried to blow off before. And nope, Bigfoot keeps coming back. <laughs> Yeah, good luck just ignoring that. You know, if you, <laughs> you, you can try the you can try the childhood thing, right? <laughs> they don't exist because you can't see me. <laughs> Is that like it with most cryptids, though? In my opinion, in a lot of cases, yes. Mm -hmm. But I like the way I heard it put one day. Right, those that believe don't require proof. And those that don't believe, there's no no proof possible. Okay. This is why I keep telling people that, you know, people have asked me before, you know, why, why believe? And it's like, I'm not the one to try and convince you. I believe what I believe because I don't have a lot of options. All right. Why don't you have options? 
Basically, because I keep getting thrown back into the into the maelstrom. Well, you're a good letter oh. carrier. That's a good union position. You get a pension. You get, you know, four weeks holidays. Yeah, and with my leg, can you really picture me doing that much walking? We're going to get you a scooter. We're going to get the union to get you a scooter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm in love with scooters right now. I'm so glad I have one. <laughs> All right. Dirty Filth is asking, Nicole, do you carry around small notebooks and multiple pens? I do. Three pens. This is Keith's, yeah, note. win, this is Keith's notebook. And then just, you know, for the randomness of every day... <laughs> Little, big, and I do have a pocket size one as well, but it's in like with my wallet and stuff, so I can always leave with it. <laughs> do you have a? I'm, I'm actually pleased to see that you've got the the pay the paperback side. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, it's just habit. I mean, I have a lot of stuff on my PC too, but I'm old school. I handwrite a lot of things and then transfer it well, the notes do you, properly. Do you need a pen? <laughs> my car is full of pain. Oh, nice. oh yeah. I only use the Uniball 207. That's right. It. It's the only pen I use. <laughs> even at my daytime yeah, job. I, get hold of. E even at my job, I know when somebody has stolen my pen because I'm the only <laughs> one there who uses the Uniball 207. And I go ballistic yeah. when that happens. Uh, Big J is asking Keith, do you believe God is an AI theory? No, God is a very, very real entity. The AI theory is an intriguing thought process, but it doesn't hold a lot of water, and people better pray they never get true AI, not based on the way humans build things. There are intelligent machines, don't get me wrong, but God itself has nothing to do with that. Well, that's not entirely correct. If you go with the eye with the belief that God created everything, then he's got everything to do with it. But he himself is not an AI. All right. Apollo 11 is asking, Nicole, so do you send out a community notice when you stream live like Dave at Nicole? I Savage? haven't yet. It's been so spontaneous and it's new for me that I need to get my... Um, act together a little bit and yeah, like promote when the live is going to happen. <laughs> mm, but I'll right. try Apollo. I'll try. But if you subscribe, you get reminders or notifications anytime I do. So, and I will always share it to my Facebook page yes. as soon as it happens. So we, we should remind our audience that you can sign up and hit subscribe on Nicole Sackage's YouTube channel, as well as our Keith Andrews as well, 509 is asking, where are the Archangels, Cherubim, right now at when will they be returning? Well, that's the funny part. The Angelus right now are in their own home for the most part, although they do come here periodically to keep an eye on things. But what he's referring to, I suspect he's referring to the great return of the mass, the the mass reemergence, re and he's going to be really unhappy about the fact they're not scheduled for it. Mankind is supposed to be turning themselves around. Hopefully, mankind gets it right this time. But you know, we are talking mankind. Michael is asking: Is there such thing as a dogman alien? And if there is, can they be counted as werewolves? Um, I'm not certain I'd call the dogman werewolves, but do werewolves, as in lichen, exist? The answer is definitively yes. They're not entirely what people are assuming, but you really don't want to do it. I heard one person say they wanted to chase, they wanted to track a werewolf into its own den. You know, just to, to see where they live and to get a reaction. I'm thinking, like, that's just plain suicidal. It's kind of like crawling into a wolverine's den just to see how happy he is. It happens. People do it. People do it. 
All right. I thought, we're, I thought werewolves were people, though. So wouldn't their den be their house, like after they turn back into a person? Well, that's why I said werewolves aren't exactly what people think. Mm. Werewolves aren't exactly humans that become this uh, this agitated thing. Problem is that way back when they when when um, the human side of it was discovered, what it boiled down to was people that were off kilter and went completely off the deep end under a full moon. It was more of a psychological miscalculation, not a physical transformation. Gotcha. Okay, lichen are literally bipedal, and they appear as many different as... There's various different types of animals, but they come from... They seem to come primarily from Lyra. All right, moving on here. Sandra wants to know, do aliens wear hoodies? Uh, That depends on if they're on Earth. Let's claim they are. Okay, then probably. They're easy to blend in with. Who doesn't wear hoodies? In some cases, I mean, there are some races you can have the biggest hoodie on the planet. It wouldn't help. What do you think, Nicole? Uh, Everybody should wear a hoodie. (laughs) The only one I, I can figure out that can't wear a hoodie is our listener, Fap, because he can't get his head inside the hoodie. <laughs> That's it. All right. He just needs like, a bigger hoodie. He's, he, there's not enough material out there, Keith. Uh, they're perfect. They're perfect. You know, they conceal. You can, like, hide in them. They're, like, puffy. I could see, like, a gray hiding their big dome under a hoodie. Or Well, well if you know. take a gray's dome and you multiply it by two, that's Fap. Our listener. <laughs> There's no hoodie that's going to fit that. None. It's right. just called custom made, Dave. Exactly. All right, Cat Chaser is asking, why are we here, Keith? That's the easy part. Literally, to rediscover, to remember exactly who and what we are and what we're capable of. It is literally an issue of tracking down other parts of In a nutshell, the soul broke down into multiple small parts. Okay, each part, absolutely independent, goes out, does its own thing. Okay, but as you get close to one, what people refer to as soulmates, when you find a soulmate, when both of your corporeal bodies die, the soul merges to become a a higher entity. The purpose of coming to Earth is literally to remember who you are and to recall how to work with each other in order to actually make this planet. You know, the the planet itself, people keep looking for the Garden of Eden. Earth itself is the Garden of Eden if people take the time to get along. All right. I agree with that. Go go ahead. (laughs) Go ahead, I would say, and I agree. That's beautiful and and fab. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Uh, Troy is asking Keith: Do aliens visit Earth to mine minerals or to study life on Earth? For the most part, quite frankly, it's to study life on Earth. Zeno socioeconomics. Mm-hmm. I'm going to refer back to Preston Dennett's research. He's got a bunch of cases where people give testimony about um, seeing crafts land or being visited and seeing beans collect plants and take them. So that's pretty interesting to come across and find out about. He's got a website too and a YouTube channel, Preston Dennett. See, the, the neat little part about that is the the plants, the minerals, the people, they're all interconnected on what makes this this place work. Logan is asking, do you believe aurora is caused by the sun or something to do with inner earth? I'm going to assume he means aurora borealis. Yeah, that I'm presuming that's what he's referring to as well. Um, if you understand what an aura is, the aurora is what you call Earth, it is her aura. See, Earth itself is is a race called the Kabora. And the Aurora Borealis is 
I mean, it is technically affected by the sun because you see it mostly when the sun hits it in the right way. But it's got to be at the right harmonic run to do it, which is why you don't see it all the time. But that's her life force. I like that. All right. On that note, we're going to go to break. We got our Keith Andrews. We have Nicole Sackage for another 30 minutes here on Spaced Out Radio. Then we're going to bring in John Hudson for the UFO report, the news, and the thought of the day, and a full measurement of FAP's head. But we get back on Spaced Out Radio. I'm not going to lie, that cracked me up. That cracked me up big time. I feel like I started it with my scooter oh, yeah. comment, and I don't even know how. Snakes, thank you for the uh, super chat. Look at Fap. Never met a hoodie I could fit in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, man. Derek Doherty, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on in. Oh, you guys are terrible. You guys are terrible, Fap and Vin. We just gotta run and grab a drink of water. I'll be right back. I'm trying to do a serious radio show here, and you guys are dropping bombs like that. It's terrible. Hey, Super Gary, what's happening? I'll be back. Who's your geode? Welcome to our channel. Thank you. We're going to break here. I'll be right back. I'm back. Oh, and I'm the only one back. Okay, now. So I do have some some good news. I did find an artist to deal with the to deal with the races of the world's book. Since you're sitting here, I did I did actually get an artist, so I'm I'm putting them together now. Volume two, I'm hoping I'm hoping to have the pictures for that for that one, but I've got some of the pictures here. I just have to get one more piece of information back from the artist that in order for me to start being able to to put them to use. But they are coming. Now I'm looking at some of these questions and the only reason like there's a bunch of questions listed in the in the chat room right now in the YouTube chat room. Um the only reason I'm not answering them right now is because I don't know what Dave's going to going to deal with and I always let him kind of decide which questions get answered. However, I will say if you've got questions, if you track down my track down my YouTube channel Inner Voice Enterprises or just literally, type, if you type in R. Keith Andrews into the search, you'll come up with a whole pile of videos of mine. The biggest one that I do, the biggest series running right now, is called The Journey. And underneath all of, the, of those videos are contact points to get a hold of me. If you've got questions that I don't answer here, absolutely drop me a line, and I will do my best to, to answer them. I do stay in constant you know, in constant uh, connection with that channel in order to see what I'm up to. You're back. I went yeah. to your corner there, Nick, and um, nobody was here. I had but, yeah. to. Like, like I said, if, if you've got questions and we don't get them answered here, drop me a line and I will be happy to do my best to answer them. I've had a lot of questions come in. The one question that I will mention, because I would have mentioned it in the next, in the next, um, what should we call it, the next video that I do, which will be done tomorrow. I was going to answer the question anyway, but I'm using an old, I found an old coffee pot that I still have. I don't have a coffee urn yet, but I do know where to get one. One of the viewers actually sent me a link and I'm going to be looking into it. It turns out I've already got the Amazon the Amazon account. So thank you very much for that. 
Apollo, this is my trick. <laughs> you want Apollo, really neat trick? You hold the cup there, you put the bottle there, and watch the bottle fill. <laughs> no, I always start off with coffee, and then I switch to some soda. But, you know, I was um, noticing that it's not very, like, ladylike to, like, chug a giant Mountain Dew in the middle of a broadcast. So it's I'm not bad if you hold it. You thing. know... Make it look a little nice. <laughs> yeah, just hold on one finger, Nick. It'll look it'll look classy. This one's so big, I need all of my fingers to stabilize it. <laughs> See, that, that cup I couldn't hold on to. Because that handle you've got, my fingers won't fit in it. So dainty. Yeah, I don't. I just bypass it. I loop it. <laughs> all right, we have one minute here, guys. Here, here's one that you'll love. You have the world's biggest, I know. This is like the biggest in the galaxy. That's the one he keeps going bang, bang, bang with. This is the one that was actually built for the series. Oh, wow. This thing actually holds a pint and a half. <laughs> but that one was built, that was actually built, that's one of the, of the things in the Elder Walking Chronicles. Is that like the skull of your enemy? <laughs> your no. worst enemy? No, it was literally made out of a burl. <laughs> nice. It's just a natural cup. Yep. I like it. But it's a, it's a decent size. Beautiful. Hello, gorgeous Gloria from Casual Conversation. How are you? Uh, Fap says, I think I could fit my head in that mug, Nicole. That's saying something. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a decent-sized coffee cup. All right, guys, here we go. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. All you got to do is go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Terrasis. Terrasis is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spaced off, uh, spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we introduce our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection. We are also joined by author and researcher, Nicole Sackett, welcome back to the show. We're going to get right to the questions. Magic Maiden is asking Keith, what beings are from Mars? Martokians. They look similar to humans, but they average about six feet tall, reverse knees, right? And they are, I mean, they're kind of an off green in color. So, I mean, the idea of, of little green men from Mars, well, they are green. They're just not that little unless you look at their kids. This is why when people talk about colonizing Mars, I'm looking at it going, I think they call that an invasion when it's already occupied. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Evil Carl is asking, Keith, why sometimes do I see UFOs and sometimes I don't? Is there a reason for this? Well, my first inclination would be to say that sometimes they're there and sometimes they're not. That usually works. But, Keith, there are people out there who, you know, you could be standing next to someone, they could see a UFO, and you're not seeing it. 
that's because of the vibratization and the, the vibra and the vibration of the whole thing on the subquantum levels. It doesn't always register for every person. Can I jump in a little bit with that? Sure. Um, you know, I, I've come across, uh, and I think other researchers have too, that like sometimes there is a trauma trigger, a, a trauma that has triggered an event or Sometimes I've even come across where you hear these stories that people have had contact and then contact goes away and they wonder why or what like makes it start again. And when you really start talking with them, it seems like there's a trigger, like maybe a depression in their life or something that is like kicked it back to them in some way, shape or form. And I think that goes back to what we were saying earlier. You have to look outside just like this UFO hat and find these other experiences. And then you can see like this pattern possibly throughout your whole life. So that's an interesting way to put it. Never thought about it that way. Hexstar is asking, what are angels and where do they manifest from Keith? Angels literally are a race called Anjanas, which looks very similar to humans, but are completely winged. Okay. Now, exactly which plant they come from, to be frank, I'm not entirely certain where they started. I know they are around here an awful lot, but they stay just out of sync for the most part. They stay at a, at a offset vibratory rate, which is why you don't see them very much. Hmm. You know, every now and again, you know, you'll see somebody walking along and, they, and literally they are very fine looking individuals, but the wings don't, when we talk about their wings folding away, they do, but then take a look at a seagull or any bird for that matter. When they fold their wings down, they tuck up pretty tight. So they'll appear to be a little heavier set, right, than, than normal humans. But very fine featured. Perfect. Nikki is asking, why would ETs do surgery on a human to help them? What would be their point to do it? What did they get out of it? There are, especially when you look at the greys, there are some that that's literally all they do, and their purpose for doing it is simply to help the human that, and that is, is wounded. Now, in answer to the question, why don't they heal everybody? Well, why doesn't a you know why doesn't a restaurant serve every type of food? You know, I mean, basically, it boils down to personal choice on their part. Hmm. But it's not a question of getting paid; it's a question of what they feel. It's very much like your, uh, what are they called, philanthropists, uh, philanthropists on Earth. They help people because that's what they decide to do. Because it makes them feel better. Some, some re researchers have noticed a pattern to um, testimony that some people have been healed or can heal after their experience. And to take the research even further, a lot of people have um, collected data that these people who have been healed go on to do stuff in their lives that is very philanthropic, like you just said. They might uh, change their careers and become teachers or nurses or doctors and when you start thinking about it in that sense, it's like, are they healed so they can turn around? Is that good thing? Like, does it have a blast radius? You know what I mean? And can you track that blast radius of influence? I guess you could call it like one person's influence in life can affect so many people. So oh, it absolutely can. And can you track it? The answer is yes. Yep. Okay. Does it have that kind of effect on a lot of people? Absolutely. 
because I find it the same if you if you deal with people just person to person. Mm-hmm. If you go out and bail somebody out of a major problem, they have a tendency of going out and repeating the favor. You know, the reality is that people, and all corporeals for that matter, are generally speaking decent people. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, so, I mean, it does have, a, have that shockwave effect. Right. Very much like if somebody gets assaulted, quite often they will get angry at everybody. Mm-hmm. It has a shockwave effect the same way. Karmic law is simple in that respect, and it applies to everybody. <clears throat> energy out, energy in. Mm-hmm. So when an off-worlder comes in or when an ancient race comes up and says, I'm going to heal you, quite often that causes a shockwave that that person will go out and do, the, and do it to somebody else as well. But understanding that they tend to heal people that are of a lesser evolutionary standpoint, right? it becomes harder to actually carry it forward in the same magnitude, which is why, as you point out there, Nicole, it tends to trickle off. Mm-hmm. Well, it only goes so far and then stops. <clears throat> I think it's good to note, too, that <clears throat> in this world, when we're talking about healing, it's not always as profound as, you know, a blind person getting their sight back or a long, lifelong illness suddenly disappearing. You know, it's not always that profound. And when people claim to have gifts of being able to heal, that can be an array of things. You know, there's, I think people often just think of it as this hands-on sort of healing that we see in other spirituality, but it can even be as simple as you have this gift of being a wonderful listener. So if you can listen to people's problems and make them feel better by, you know, lending them an ear, that's a healing gift. Or another of one of these spiritual gifts is honestly the gift of gab. And we're all doing it right now. When we talk about these issues, it makes some people feel better. It triggers other people into wanting to dive deeper into these topics. That's a gift. And, you know, and it's simpler than just always like, oh, I'm cured of a disease. Like, you know, you can really put it on like a day-to-day basis instead of like, you know, something that ever. Oh, yeah. I mean, let's face it, take a look at the power of a smile. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's face it, that does not have, that has a a capability of changing the world. Well, here, one of my favorites is how good does it feel to get a hug? When you need a hug and, you know, something is bad and somebody gives you a good hug, like, wow, like that, it really feels good. And that's something that's so simple, like... (laughs) Free hugs. <laughs> Vinny is asking, our Keith, well, we know you've been abducted. When's the last time you were abducted? Uh, about a week ago. What happened? Well, I ended up having a heck of a problem. I couldn't quite figure out what the problem was, and that was the biggest issue. Normally, it's, it's called contact. But I woke up. Um, basically the entire event, I'm not entirely certain of at this point. I'm, I'm figuring that'll kick back in in a week or so, but I do know I suffered from a massive potassium crash, right? And was completely out of, out of sorts for about three days. And I do know that that means that whatever went down created some real bad side effects, and normally that's, like like I said, unfortunately, we're only talking about a week ago and the way my mind has always worked. That'll take me a little while to piece together. I can see that. I can see that. All right, next question comes from Jennifer. Are there ET animals out there? Absolutely. One primary example would be your Chitawara, which people call a cryptid. Except it way it isn't from here to start with. So I mean, from that standpoint, yeah, there are definitively animals out there. The neat part is, if you go to Zeta Reticuli, there's a lot of what you would call ET plants. And rest assured, 
on Zeta Reticuli, much as the as the, as the greys are wonderful people, the plants, not so much so. How come? Because most of the plants on Zeta Reticuli are carnivorous. Feed me, Seymour. Feed me. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yep. All right. Let, let's go on here as we got more questions from our audience with time winding down. Apollo was asking, do aliens ever have fun or is it always all down to business? Oh, heavens, the first the first crew that I ran into when I was five years old, um, I was, you know, when I ended up on their on their ship, they had a whole pile of, of short of short aliens. I don't know if they were kids or if some of them were adults, but they were all about the same height and they played what was, what amounted to zero G wall ball. <laughs> Right, so instead of playing wall ball with only the with only the four walls to work with, they played with the roof and the and the floor at the same time. That actually sounds fun. I know. It's a riot. <clears throat> hmm. I want to play that. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. But they've got. I mean, some of the games are a lot more violent. Like, for instance, if you take a look at some of the of the more violent races. In games like like um, baseball, you know, people made fun of it back in the in the eighties in the in, with humans. But when you're taking a look at like, for instance, your Maldakians, they do play a game similar to baseball, but they carry the the bat with them. <laughs> I've always thought that should be an option, honestly. So <laughs> somebody could get hurt. You know, well, it's like a the combination idea. of hockey and baseball, you know, like, I don't know. See, when I was growing up, hockey was a case of I went to a, into a fight and a hockey game broke out. <laughs> yeah, I don't like that. I don't like that, that at all. That's why I quit watching it. Hmm. Oh, gosh. How oh, I miss a good but, hockey fight. Grand Master yeah, is asking. They absolutely asking, have different games. Grand Master, Master is asking, are we aliens? I can't speak for him. I was born here. Hmm. Have scientists ever seen the backside of <laughs> Fab's head? No. No. I can see that's going to drag on for a while. Yeah. Uh, for our radio listeners, Fap is one of our ch frequent chatters and wrenches in our YouTube chat. And uh, he's got a large melon. He can't wear baseball caps because there isn't enough room. Well, I, I do feel for him. The in Colony here, the the band, the large hats are usually a double X. For me to find a cowboy hat, I actually had to get a four X hat in order to be able to wear it. This just in, Avi Loeb now claims that Fap's head is what drew a mua mua towards Earth. <laughs> wow, you went there. That is amazing. All right. John is asking. Now it's over. Now it's over, though. <laughs> just boom. John is asking, are any of these races UN members secretly? Now, I cannot speak to that specifically, but I can tell you that none of them are, that none of them are permitted to take in a position of power. That doesn't mean they won't be and won't be part of the UN, but they won't be in a position. Not knowing the exact structure of the UN myself, if you have to be a person in power to be in to be sitting in the UN, then the answer would have to be no. Because the, unlike way. humans, the consortium is none too happy about disobeying their laws. Okay. Let's move on. Snakes is asking, are the races shown in the Men in Black movies possibly based on fact, such as the Balchinians? Um, not recalling the Balchinians personally, I will tell you whole and absolutely that um, that some of the races in that show are 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 definitely based on it. 
I can't breathe right now. You know that's a real one. You know that. Oh, the Balchinians are out there. They're from somewhere. Just hanging around. Balchin. Keith has no clue what we're talking about. Go back and watch uh, Men in Black, the original <laughs> one for the Balchinians. I did well. I fortunately I did watch the the Man in Black, and that was that's why I said I do know some of them are based on on fact, but I couldn't speak to all of them. Okay, well let, let me ask you this: getting back to the uh, the whole idea of men, the movie Men in Black, do extraterrestrials need to check in? Do they have a check in almost like their own airport where they got to check in with their passports? With their passports, no. Has something to do with the fact that the that what we call the security system, where you walk through the metal detector, mm-hmm. they do that before they even get into orbit. Okay. You know, it's more a question of you come through it through a through a bio a bio field, and they've got all the information, but. They have to get literal clearance, and more often than not, they have to get training before they let you know, are let down on Earth. Vinny wants to know who are the Men in Black. Well, that depends on who we talk to. I mean, I do remember Johnny Cash was called that for the longest time, <laughs> but the Men in Black are colloquially, from my understanding. A government agency that is supposed to be dealing with a whole pile of of super secret stuff. All right, Evil Carl, Keith, I heard small greys have plant craft UFOs and have big worms in the greenhouse garden. Does that make any sense to you, or is he just being Evil Carl? <laughs> He's probably being Evil Carl, but the reality is some of the worms they've got in their gardens will eat the grays. So they they absolutely have have big underground, you know, the the bigger animals. I'm thinking trimmers, like Kevin Bacon trimmers. Yeah. Those kind of worms. (laughs) Oh, those weren't worms, but yes. Whatever. That kind of thing is quite normal. Or what's the the thing? Those are are more common on the Strasazian homeworld. What's the thing in Star Trek? Or Star Wars that eats Boba Fett. That oh, thing I know what you're referring to. to. Oh, yeah, the big teeth there. Big That's teeth. like my Megalodon there, Dave. <laughs> well, they have, Megalodons were nice little animals. Well, they have death worms on this planet, allegedly. <laughs> Hexstar is asking, as we got two minutes left, were the Freemasons or were the Freemasons or Illuminati formed by an extraterrestrial <laughs> race? No. Not from anything I've ever seen. Um, the Freemasons themselves seem to be a very human evolution, and the Illuminati, well, let's just say them and I had a, had a run-in a while back, and they weren't overly happy with me. But then I keep telling people, I make everybody happy. Some people by showing up, and most of them by leaving. <laughs> Very true. That's how I feel every day when I go into work. <laughs> All right. That time of the night again, everyone. Our Keith Andrews, tell everybody where they can find your YouTube channel and your information. I know uh, uh, Dirty Filth is also wondering where to get your Alien Races book. That's the easy part. My YouTube channel is is Inner Voice Enterprises. Or you can just scan for our Keith Andrews and it'll show up anyway. You'll find the videos. As far as getting in touch with me to get the the Alien Races book, there's a list of contact numbers under every video where you can contact me at any one of them. Right. Easiest, of course, would be at innervoiceenterprises at yahoo.ca. Wonderful. Nicole, 30 seconds. Let everybody know where your YouTube channel is. Um, my name, Nicole Sackage, YouTube channel. You can also find me on Facebook. Either has my contact information. If you would like my email, 
yada, yada, yada. Thank you, everybody. It's been wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. My YouTube channel is Spaced Out Radio. If you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, I highly suggest you do because, well, we're gaining listeners and followers. <laughs> we're almost at 13,000, so much so that many people think we're buying our subscribers. All I can say is this. If we were buying our subscribers, Nicole, we'd have about 100,000 by now. <laughs> You're making better money than I am. Exactly. Coming up next, John Hudson is here for the UFO Report, Shirky's Newswire, and the Thought of the Day. Stay tuned. Spaced Out Radio continues after this. We're clear. Okay. Thank well, you. Was fun. It's different, but... Mm-hmm. That was fun. Thank you. Bap, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to tell a big head joke. <laughs> no, that was awesome. That was awesome. The don't apologize for that. Did you see what he called me? Fat. No, I turned I turned off the chat after I made the joke. I was like, eh. <laughs> no way, man. No way. All right. Pretty cool. That was a good show. It was. Solid radio yeah. there. Solid radio. I hope uh, Shirky Poo, her, her news is awesome as usual, but I'm going to head out and head to bed so I can uh, double time it at the restaurant tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Oh, Fab says he's going to tuck Nicole into bed now. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Fap. If I go upstairs and you're in there, get ready to be thrown out the window. <laughs> he, he, you never have to worry. He can't fit through the bedroom door. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Your bedroom will always be a safe place around Fap. <laughs> I'm picturing like Willie the Giant now, like coming down that giant beanstalk and. <laughs> you nev never, ever want to push Fap down a snow cap hill because it'll start an avalanche with him being the boulder all right guys i love you both catch take, you soon take care bye <laughs> our keith take care bye bye bud all right we're just waiting for stetson john to get in here there he is How you doing, buddy? Hello, hello. 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 Anybody out there? Hello. Oh, don't. You, you, you know what that is? You know what that is, right? Is there anybody out there? <laughs> every. Oh, yeah. Every time I used to get taken, I used to hear that. Right before. So, oh, you go oh, that's right. I heard you say that the other day. That was, that, that's actually not cool. Yeah, I mean using <laughs> using using Pink Floyd. That that was that, I, I just I, I totally forgotten about that. I apologize because that, that I don't know whose idea that was, but that was kind of messed up. Yeah, it was not mine. But what do you do? I blame Pascal. It's okay. There's, there's probably someone out there that has you know 500 miles as their as their you know trigger song, so it could be worse. Mm -hmm. By the way, Vinny's the only guy who needs uh, tandem wheels on the back of a scooter. <laughs> I just thought of that. I thought that was funny. <laughs> <clears throat> mm-hmm. Oh, God. What a funny night. The Balchinians. That movie that movie did a fantastic job of of taking it just a little bit seriously and then doing a fantastic job making fun of the whole thing. Oh yeah. Here's Fap. If you bastards saw me in person, you'd never guess my head was that big. <laughs> Your head is the size of four Chad Smiths. Hmm. 
All right. The big the people are asking why are you hiding behind your microphone. Oh, it's it's the way the way I sit and the way it comes and and uh, you know, I'll probably get a different setup at some point. But uh... yeah, you know what else we gotta we gotta do for future shows? Are, are you running on Wi Fi? Are you plugged in? Uh, at the moment, I'm uh, I'm running on Wi-Fi, but one thing I I keep meaning to do is is um, I have a, a a separate, more stable Wi-Fi network that I can click on to that I probably should um, because I I heard some distortion the other day that really bugged me. Yeah, we just had it. Well, let me. Um, how much time do we have? Oh, about thirty seconds. We'll let it go for tonight, but for next time. We'll let it go. It's all good. We got twenty seconds. Hold on, Johnny. Third, we're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Dave Scott is my name. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I want to remind you that if you miss most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with the unbiased UFO report as we bring in Stetson John Hudson to give us the update of what is going on around the UFO world. Calm before the storm as we wait for the aliens to arrive, or at least the government, to talk more about them john welcome back thank you sir good to be here how you doing i am good man i am very very good not really (laughs) not really at all i'm not happy with myself actually (laughs) that's a horrible way to wake up i mean to wake up from a nap like that and realize you got three minutes to to do something or be somewhere it's 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 really not a good way to wake up it was terrible terrible and you know like honestly you, you feel like you're out of breath you feel like you're out mm, of breath, like yeah. you're, you're trying to catch up, and it just doesn't seem to work. Doesn't seem to work. Let's yeah. head into the oceans and the yep. waterways. Popular mechanics looking into USOs. What's going on there? Well, this is just you know. I mean, if if, if you read the article, and and I'll, I'll post a link later, and I encourage everyone to check it out. Um, you know, it, they're they're not really they're not really supplying any anything that was new to me, at least, right? I mean, any. Um, you know, any any new data that we hadn't heard before, but what they did do was what everyone else hasn't been doing, and that is that what you found in other reports is that most of the the information about USOs has been omitted. Now, whether this is done for uh, you know clarity or or content size, or I have no idea, but very often the USO information is either played down or it's um, you know it's not really dealt with, and so the fact that Popular Mechanics is actually uh, you know, writing it first off, Popular Mechanics is writing a UFO article, right? So that's always a good thing. And two, the fact that they're actually, you know, specifically calling out USOs. And as I as I think that that, that you and I have talked about it at some point in the past, uh, the whole idea of calling them a USO, UFO, I mean, the one of the five observables that Lou Elizondo uh, talks about is that they are transmedium devices, meaning they can go from orbit to space to to see without it really seeming to impact them at all. And so realistically, we're guessing that probably any, you know, any UFO type object would also be a USO. And so, you know, it's possible that, that these terms kind of fall by the wayside as time goes on, but it's it was it was a nicely written article. It was it was good to see popular mechanics jumping into it and it was nice to see someone focusing on, you know, what I consider to be a, a more interesting aspect of of the phenomenon because there's so many other attributes that fall in, into the to the USO category. 
Very true, very true, and I and I can see that. But is it the significance that we need to be worrying about UFOs underwater right now, or should we be concentrating on them in the sky? Well, unfortunately, that really depends on where you think they come from. Um, you know, because one of the you know one of the many hypotheses that's been considered is is being considered is that they they might actually um, either um, you know come from a, a body of water or they might use a body of water as a um, as a uh, kind of a local way station uh, for when they come when they come here. And so, uh, you know, it, it might be that, you know, if we really want to catch them uh, in their, say, more, you know, natural habitat, you might say, um, you know, going going in and looking for them in the seas, you know, might actually be might actually be a good way to do it. And because of the work that the DOE does on looking for nuclear detonations, we have that acoustic network on the ocean floor that you know, just the other day uh, was able to find that new species of whale, and so realistically, we should be able to identify USOs um, at least by some frequencies, uh, you know, fairly accurately. All right, let's move. Well, on. at least they can. Let's move on to our next topic here because I'm going to be honest. USOs really don't interest me because they're near, <laughs> they're near sharks, and I'm not going there. Oh right, not, right. Not, you know, not they're probably. There. They probably work together, Dave. No. A couple weeks ago, we had Ross Coltard on, award-winning journalist out of Australia, who, you know what? The more and more I see about him online and what he's doing, the more and more I believe this man is going to single-handedly force journalism into really hammering investigative uh, techniques into this story and god bless him for that because he is doing some amazing work what do you get up to now well so well, first off i could not agree more and there's, there's probably a couple other points that i'll i'll, I'll, I'll point out on his work in, in the next couple of weeks because there's certain things that have just really impressed me because he has he's taken this very aggressive um but you know polite but very aggressive um real you know journalist approach to digging out these issues and it's working. It is, I mean, he's really getting some good data. And so a really good example of this is, and it's funny we're getting this from an Australian individual, is the the SAP program. So a lot of people have heard of the SAP program in, in clearance worlds, it's special access programs. And a lot of us, you know, might be aware that, you know, once you have a, a TS, you know, SCI level clearance that you then have the ability to be read into one of these SAP programs. And in most cases, these SAP programs are, are so protected that you, you can't even acknowledge their, what their name is. If someone identifies their name to you, you can't even say, oh, yeah, you guessed it, right? So, I mean, these are very, very sacred programs. There's been rumors forever that there are deeper programs. And what Ross did is he actually went through and did, did the legwork and does a, a great job of... Uh, explaining that not only are there SAPs, but there are also what are called unacknowledged SAPs. And so these basically fall under a category where they are, are not uh, under the purview of, of certain members of, of Congress and are not in certain members of, uh, uh, they don't show up in certain, in certain reports and so forth. And then there is, and those we were more sure about, the very rare waived unacknowledged SAPs. And those programs are really off the books. Um, they're, we don't know for sure, but there's a very good chance that if you're not on um, the, the, the list uh, for that, for that uh, WUSAP, as uh, some people will call it, um, that essentially, uh, you know, there is, because there is an oversight committee uh, for the SAP program that, that kind of self-manages it. And, uh, you know, so the SAPs are all taken care of. My understanding is the, the, um, the unacknowledged um, ones may not be exposed to members of Congress, but they are, you know, uh, paid attention to by the, by the committee. It's unknown whether the waived unacknowledged programs have any oversight at all. Uh, we really don't know. And um, and these are programs where, and I've spoken to an individual that was involved in one, and um, according to him, 
um, his NDAs um, lock him in till death. Um, he is never, ever, ever for the rest of his life allowed to talk about any aspect of the work he did. Now, for people in translation SAPs, we're talking black projects, like like whatever Correct. replaced the SR-71. Yes, or, or honestly, it could be a sensitive listing device, or it could be... It could honestly be an a a a, 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 um, a interrogation methodology that, with some devices. It's basically any incredibly difficult problem that you need to solve, where anyone finding out about it would put people's lives at jeopardy. Interesting. All right. And one thing to note is that the DOE has a completely separate program from the DOD, so they have their own set of SAPs, and we assume. Um, you know, uh, USAPs and WUSAPs. Uh, and those are even more opaque to us. All right. Uh, let's go into update on Travis Walton. What's happening there? Yeah, so I don't, you know, some of these things are planned in the future. So I don't know how much of this is um, is really about Travis, um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, rebutting the, the criticisms he's had, or if it's just um, weird timing, or if perhaps the timing might be informative uh, as to what's going on. But essentially, the, um, the hit uh, documentary series on Netflix, which uh, I recently read is actually the number three series now um, on Netflix, uh, their most recent episode is a, uh, a, a complete um, a look at the Travis Walton case. And so that's a good opportunity for people that want to know more about um, you know, what, what's going on there for him to look into it. Uh, for them to look into it. And then uh, some people may not be aware, but there's a, a very interesting podcast um, called The Theory of Everything. Um, it's usually um, a very, very um, technical, um, deep um, uh, discussion. Um, and it's usually around uh, math and, and physics and, and consciousness and so forth. And uh, today, Travis did an Answer Anything um, uh, episode with... Uh, the theory of everything. And so I, I haven't been able to hear yet when that will air, but um, I know they were looking for questions today. And so uh, it'll be very interesting to see what comes out of that. And my assumption is that that is as a result of, of what's been going on. And hopefully there'll be some questions answered by Travis in that talk that will, you know, uh, help people make a decision one way or the other. Is Mike Rogers finally buttoned up his lips on this? I have not heard anything from him in a week or so. Um, his last interview with uh, Erica Lukes, I believe is her name. Yeah. Um, that that was that was a that, that was a, a very unfortunate interview for him. Um, I, I don't think he would have come off much worse if he tried. And um, and so my my sinking suspicion is that after that performance, you know, he may be deciding that it's better for him not to. Um, you, you kind of broke you know, up to as be... to what happened there. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. I'm um, just that uh, the the interview went very very badly, um, very very badly for him. And and there's a good chance that he um, that he maybe is is taking a um, a, a step back from the public light for a while um, as a result of that of that interview. Do you think, uh, it, it was very unfortunate. Do you think in everything you've read that Mike Rogers, who was the crew leader, the owner of that logging company on that fateful day that Travis Walton was abducted by aliens, do you think he fully understands the damage he ca he's caused over the last few months? No. No. No, I, I, I don't. I mean, he might be beginning to. Um, that that's very, very possible, but no, I, I got the impression that, um, all of his actions were, were, were occurring at a, at a point in his life where he was very, um, very focused on, on his own surroundings and not, not, not the, the larger ramifications. Um, because, um, yeah, because the, 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 yeah, it's, 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 it, the whole thing's just really unfortunate. It really, really is. What else is a hot button issue? J.J. Abrams UFO documentaries is gaining a lot of steam right now on Netflix. Well, yeah. Well, so I just personally, I, I, and and 
I apologize. This may not be as exciting to other people as it is to me. I, I am a student of, of the process as, as, much, as, as much as I am the content. And for me right now, who is doing work? Who is doing documentaries, how they're going about it, who is writing articles, how they're going about it is in many cases as interesting as the actual content they're covering. And here you have, uh, you know, Netflix, I mean, you have a Showtime not only, um, you know, doubling down, you know, by bringing in J.J. Abrams to do this, you know, four part series, but then they um you know uh they, the time was doing this um you know conversation where they were bringing in um greg and i, I apologize if i'm unwilling his name uh, um Aginian, uh who's a, a phd from penn state university uh, as well as the director and executive producer uh, mark um, marone uh, mark moreau um from from the documentary and just doing a a, a long form um conversation where they were going into a lot of the backstory and going into a lot of the process and you know for for showtime to be advertising that that talk session as much as they are as a auxiliary package to the four part series it, it just shows that ev everyone is just doubling down and they're they're you're really starting to see um uh uh, people see a lot of um, um, uh, earning potential in the in the UFO topic. One thing, good or I, bad. One thing I have a big issue with: nothing against the people, but against these directors, against these um, documentaries. It's the same people giving the same message on different film each time. And that's where I get worn out. Because, you know what, I, I can honestly say, you know, and I hate to admit this, probably shouldn't, because it's part of my homework for this show, but I don't watch documentaries of UFOs. Because if I see Richard Dolan in one, nothing against Richard Dolan, I know he's pretty much saying the exact same thing in the same documentary or a different documentary three channels down. And, oh, you know, Stanton Friedman or Linda Moulton Howe, we used to see them on every one. I mean, we're getting a few new faces now, but I mean. Yeah, it, and it's really unfortunate because the problem is, is that when someone new jumps into the pool, the, the first people they see are, are these people floating, floating on top, right? And so right. they go to them because they're safe. Absolutely. And they're safe to them because they're new. But for anyone that, that has been studying this for more than, you know, a week... Um, you know, you get the perspective that, that you're describing, which is that, you know, unless, you know, unless, you know, Dolan's um, discovered a new case or he's writing a new book, uh, it's incredibly unlikely that he's going to say anything that I haven't heard him say before. Well, I mean, I'll give you an example. And it's hard. I'll give you an example. There's a podcaster out there who has never been a journalist. Okay. She doesn't even have a radio show anymore. She literally was given the golden crown and then dropped the ball well she's on the on discovery channel as a ufo journalist now as an expert and i'm sitting here thinking how do i take this seriously nothing against the person because all of us would do it but are they these networks not doing the homework that if you see someone you know i don't know maybe i should just bite my tongue at this point because it's frustrating and that's probably well, what I'm going to do. The, the only thing I would tell you, Dave, is that is that I've been involved in other in other movements in other in other um, areas of of research where we've been at a similar point than this, and there is always this huge problem of how do you establish credibility, and how do you and how do you actually evaluate different researchers, and how do you how do you compare them to each other. And and right now the field is so loose and it's so wild west that that you just it's it's a mess and and honestly this it's a lot of it just has to do with the maturity level of of this research space. Very it's, true. Um, you know, it's just the nature of the beast. Very true. All right, John, we will talk to you next time on the unbiased UFO report. Great job once again. Let's get to the news. Thank you, sir.
The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR News Wire. At the back end of every show where we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and sometimes the McDonald's. A Russian woman is suing McDonald's, claiming ads for their cheeseburgers made her break her month-long fast for Lent. And while that's already unusual enough, Kasina Ovchinikova, Ovchinikova and the Orthodox Christian from Omsk, Russia, is only asking for 1,000 rubles or 17 bucks Canadian as compensation for the sustained moral damage. Ovechkinina says McDonald's cheeseburgers and McNuggets ads prevented her from staying away from meat and other animal products during Lent in April 2019. Lent is a period during which the Orthodox Christians follow the Julian calendar, us good Ukrainians do that, and are expected to abstain from eat meat, pardon me, nope, meat byproducts, not here, poultry, not here, eggs, only at breakfast, and dairy. Yeah, yeah, I don't think she'll win. I don't think she will win at all. Now, sticking with McDonald's, Wisconsin man who held the Guinness World Record for the lifetime Big Mac consumption since 1999 has had his record updated with his latest total. 32,340. Donald Gorski says he averages two of the McDonald's sandwiches a day, and he's been making them part of his routine since 1972. How is he not fat? Honestly. A sealed copy of Super Mario Brothers for the Nintendo Entertainment System has sold for $2 million. You know, we all had this game. We all did. Breaking a record for video game sales that was set less than a month earlier. Collectibles investment website Rally announced the new inbox copy of the 1985 video game was purchased by an anonymous buyer for $2 million, breaking a record that was set in July when a copy of Super Mario 64 sold by or sold for $1.56 million. The Super Mario 64 game was sold just two days after the previous record amount of $870,000 was paid of a copy of 1987's Nintendo game, The Legend of Zelda. Oh, I love that game. I think we're starting to see the natural progression of what else? What are the things that have appreciated in value from my childhood that have nostalgia? Rob Petrozo has said. He's one of the founders of Rowley. Oh, man. To think. To think. How are we so stupid? How are we so stupid back in the Nintendo days? Thank you to Captain Shirk for the awesome news on the SOR Newswire. Thank you to Big John Hudson for the unbiased UFO report. And our Keith Andrews and Nicole Sackage for the ET Connection. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat room tonight on YouTube, LGAB, Twitch, Revolution Radio, Facebook, Spreaker, and on Twitter. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, we're watching. We own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night.